Genesis. Barkley is back. And Beverly sums up this episode, so I don't have to. He transformed into a spider, and now he has a disease named after him. We begin in Sick Bay, where Riker is having cactus spines pulled out of his back. He is openly discussing how he just had a bunch of sex and cacti, proving that this season truly deserved all of the awards that it won. Barkley, who we haven't seen in some time, is talking to Beverly about a whole list of symptoms that he's convinced indicate any number of fatal diseases. She chastises him for going to SpaceWeb MD <laughs> before consulting her. Beverly ends up giving him synthetic T cells for his space flu. And then Data comes in with Spot, who is close to giving birth. Data says he prefers not to know the sex of Spot's offspring, and Nurse Ogawa reveals that she too is pregnant, but with a human baby. <laughs> She says her boyfriend Andrew was shocked, and I note that Beverly still didn't tell her about how she had seen Andrew on a date with some other girl back in Lower Decks. And I haven't been paying close enough attention, but is this the same dude Ogawa has always been talking about throughout these episodes? Good question. And there's a dumb joke about Data offering to give Andrew future father advice. That's how the episode opens. I knew this one was going to be good. The Enterprise has been upgraded recently with new weapons, and Worf is taking great pleasure in running everybody through their paces. Picard just wants to get it over with, but when they fire torpedoes, one of them goes wild. Which makes Worf look like an idiot because he just boasted about how he himself improved the targeting system. Picard says he and Data will go in a shuttlecraft to bring it back. Because for some reason they can't stop the torpedo, disarm the torpedo, destroy the torpedo, or just politely ask it to not do anything else. And Picard says the other weapon tests don't require his personal attention, but why would retrieving a random torpedo require his personal attention? I get that he was tired of the test, but is it normal for him to go out to get every torpedo that misses in a battle? And especially when they're in the middle of a crowded asteroid field? Well, when you're in a high enough position of power in a group of people, you can kind of just blow off whatever you want. And my question was, that torpedo would be going pretty damn fast. And it's not like they're leaving that instant. They say we're going to leave in a while. So what is their plan? To just go faster than the torpedo on its last known trajectory? Data goes to Barkley to ask him to watch over Spot while he's away with Picard, which he says may take several days. So does that mean they spend weeks after any major battles just going after stray torpedoes? Barkley asks who the father is of all the kittens, which was a good question. And Data says there are 12 possible cats. And Spot manages to escape? That seemed weird, that they would just let animals run all over the ship. Yeah. Maybe Worf hopes for that. Uh, a snack. <laughs> <laughs> Worf is getting pissed, trying to figure out what went wrong with the torpedo, smacking the console he's at, and even being curt with Riker. And when he goes to turn forward to eat a delicious Klingon meal, he even gets mad at Troy for supposedly sneaking up behind him, even though she was supposed to be meeting him for lunch. Troy requests caviar for lunch and drains a full glass of water, commenting on how dry the air is on the ship for lunch. Tch. I was totally with Worf at that part. <laughs> caviar for lunch. And when she asks Worf what's wrong, he says it's his fault that the torpedo guidance system failed. He goes to his quarters to rest, but starts acting more savage than usual, ripping his clothes, and then ripping out part of his bedding to sleep on the floor. Down in engineering, Barkley is moving a mile a minute, diagnosing and fixing everything. Jordy tells Riker that Barkley's been full of energy and working non-stop since the night before. While on the bridge, Troy keeps raising the temperature, and Worf quips that she's already raised it three times. And when Worf says it's too hot, Troy tells him to live with it, and she leaves to go take a bath. Up in the air ducts, Jordy finds a section of the floor that has been dissolved. And he says it was seemingly caused by something organic. So if nobody got up in there to check that, there's no sensors that would say, yo, part of the floor has been dissolved. The Enterprise gets a message from Starfleet about the progress on the weapons tests, and Riker seems completely thrown off and doesn't know what to tell them. He's moving slower than usual and can't seem to think straight. Troy is bathing in her uniform, when Worf busts in and bites her cheek. She makes it to sickbay, where Ogawa says she's not the only one experiencing weird symptoms. But, you know, they're out in space running into new stuff all the time, so I would think people would be experiencing weird symptoms 24-7. When Beverly goes to check out Worf, he doesn't respond to her questions, and she notices a weird growth on his neck, which she says seems to be an acidic venom sac. 
and then he reptiles her right in the face. <laughs> <laughs> Later, Ogawa tells Riker that Beverly will be fine, but will need reconstructive surgery. And given how often they all surgically alter themselves to look like aliens, no one in the future should ever have a scar, and it would probably be easy for criminals to avoid detection by having surgery done on themselves. I wonder if there are people on the ship who just chose to look like their ideal self, who don't look anything like they originally looked like, but they still look like regular people, you know what I mean? I'm surprised we don't have a bunch of Rikers running around. I said ideal. <laughs> Are you saying you want to look like Riker? I did when I was a kid. I thought Riker was awesome. And I had a huge crush on Troy. Not Beverly. Nope. Not, not as a kid. So you matured. You figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> Barkley says that the acid that burned Beverly is the same thing that dissolved the floor in the air duct. And Riker admits he's been having trouble concentrating. Jordy busts in and says the sensors are having trouble tracking Worf. But doesn't explain how exactly. I mean, he's alive and he's moving. Even if they can't detect his normal life signature or whatever, couldn't they do it some other way or determine everyone else's life signature and say there's a foreign body moving around in this area? Yeah, that seems like a big fault in their sensors. Well, I mean, if they can't detect 12 freaking cats running around, I'm not really surprised. He asks Riker what they should do, but Riker can't think straight, and Jordy ends up leaving confused. And when everyone else leaves, Riker tries to contact Starfleet, but the computer tells him it needs authorization, and he can't figure out how to make it work. This is a very rare time, when something weird is going on, and they actually try to tell somebody else outside of the ship about it right away, which I really appreciated, but of course the plot <laughs> makes it not happen. Three days later, Picard and Data are heading back to the Enterprise after grabbing the stray torpedo, and they find it drifting randomly through space. They spent three days just paling around through space, finding a torpedo. What did they do during the three days? I'm sure they had some kind of weird adventure with a super powerful alien and reality-altering things. They're probably not even the same Picard and Data anymore. Was there a Deep Space Nine tie-in for this episode? I think there was. Mega Drive. <laughs> Data says the life signs on the Enterprise are distorted, but I'm not really sure what he meant. Neither were the writers. In the shuttle bay, they find weird goo over everything and that the main power is offline. And on the way to the bridge, they find what seems to be a shed reptile skin, but in humanoid shape. And for some reason, the corridors are now really echoey. I didn't realize that was part of the Enterprise's <laughs> systems to dampen sound. And they hear all these animal sounds. They finally make it to Troy's quarters, and it's super hot, and she's in the tub as a weird frog thing. <laughs> and everything is wet to the point that water is dripping from the ceiling. That's pretty wet. Tell us more, Mr. Science. <laughs> Data says that Troy's DNA is in a state of ribosciatic flux, which was obvious. I don't know why he felt he needed to point that out. Basically, she's turning into an amphibian person, even though amphibians don't have scales. And genetically, she is no longer human. And Data finds Klingon saliva in her bite wound. Picard says they need to get the ship under control. And when they make it to the bridge, they find Crewman 447 ripped apart, which was pretty brutal for this show. But not as disturbing as seeing all those chairs out of place. Data scans the ship and finds that the life forms are displaying the same effects as Troy. So why could they not track Worf earlier? He must have increased sensor efficiency by 10%. I can detect him too much. <laughs> Picard manages to restore some systems, and they hear grunting from his ready room. And when they go in, they find Caveman Riker. Were there action figures for this episode? Because I could see that. I'm pretty sure I've seen uh, the Barkley Spider, I think. Maybe I'm thinking of, I know they did one for uh, Geordi when he was uh, that laser tag monster. Data says that Riker's skull has thickened and his brain has shrunk, so he won't be able to understand their language. So naturally, Picard starts talking to him in normal, not even simplified English, he just talks louder. This is not the first time we've seen them try this approach with beings who do not understand English. Cave Riker attacks Picard, and Data zaps him. I believe the crew is de-evolving. And I will point out here that de-evolution is a concept that doesn't make sense in the first place. Even if an organism redevelops older traits, it's still evolving. 
mean, granted, my only frame of reference here is the Super Mario Brothers movie. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure they say de-evolve, but you could say devolve, right? Yeah, I would say devolve. I think the fact that you're questioning that points out how not real of a thing it is. Could just be my lack of intelligence, too. <laughs> All right, back to the episode. Yeah, speaking of lacking intelligence. <laughs> After some testing, Data says a synthetic T-cell has invaded Riker's DNA and activated latent genes. But DNA is way smaller than a cell, so I wondered how that was supposed to happen. He says the T-cells are activating Riker's latent introns, which he says contain information for earlier evolutionary characteristics, which is of course not accurate at all to real life, and again shows the writer's lack of understanding of evolution. I actually saw in the script they kept spelling genes with a J, like the pants. <laughs> And this is going too deep into it, I realize, but the entire concept of evolution revolves around your DNA mutating, so I wonder how the writers think all the new genes developed if the old ones are still there. Where where did the new ones come from? Did you even watch the episode? They explained everything. And then Data throws in one very carefully placed sentence to explain why everyone is changing into different animals. It is possible that a wide variety of transformations is occurring among the crew. Because introns can include genetic material from many different species. But they established in the chase that all humanoid life originated from a common ancestor, so they wouldn't have evolved from other life forms on their homeworld. He tells Picard that he's also infected and has about 12 hours before he turns into a lemur. <laughs> yeah, I wondered how he knew what type of primate he would de-evolve into. And even if we ignore the chase, the primates that he names as primates that Riker and Picard are going to turn into are not primates that humans evolved from. So I'm starting to wonder if Data is really as intelligent as everyone seems to think. Maybe he's de-evolving too. I wouldn't put it past the writers to say, oh, his programming is reverting back to an earlier version. And Data refers to this whole thing as an intron virus, but earlier they said it was synthetic T cells. So is the virus creating cells in the body? That's not something that viruses do in real life. But I could at least accept that as a theoretical possibility if that's what they said was happening. But they don't. Data says he can continue research in his room, which has a computer that is completely independent from the rest of the ship, because that's what the script decided should be the case in this episode. And let's assume it's always been like that. That is great. Give the robot, who has gone crazy and taken over the ship multiple times, his own independent computer that nobody else can shut down. In Data's quarters, they find that Spot has had kittens, but has de-evolved into an iguana, which of course cats did not evolve from. Wait, really? <laughs> Picard wonders why the kittens are not affected, and they drop a bunch of stuff about dedicated immune system functions in the mother's womb, but really the answer is they couldn't wrangle a bunch of baby iguanas. <laughs> And I questioned why, if Picard was infected just by being on the ship, as apparently everyone else was, why wouldn't the kittens still be affected now that they're not in the womb? They speculate they could use a pregnant humanoid to generate some kind of antibody. Data points out that Ogawa was pregnant, and then the ship shakes, and he says they need to go to engineering to fix a plasma vent. When they get down there, Picard goes to check on the warp core and finds spider webs over everything. And then through a window, he encounters Spider Barkley, which is creepy as f and the one good thing about this episode. And it causes Picard to spontaneously de-evolve into a baby. Babality. He's totally freaked out, and Data says he's probably going through the initial stages of his transformation, which I 100% disagreed with because that thing was creepy as f <laughs> Also, there were webs. There were a lot of webs. So Barkley was making webs. That, that's really nice. Try and get that picture out of your head. Yeah, it would have been cool if we saw just a random crewman kind of webbed up on the ceiling or something. They make their way to sickbay, where Data says that Kei Vogawa's embryo is not affected by the virus. So he can use her amniotic fluid as a template for a retrovirus. And I assume the writers had him say retrovirus because they thought that sounded like something that cancels out a virus, but that's not what it means. And naturally, this retrovirus will work for everybody. They just know it. He says it will restore their DNA to its previous condition. And I wondered how it was supposed to do that, and why they couldn't just use the transporter. They're interrupted by Predator Wharf smashing on the door and determined that he's trying to get to Troy. Picard says they could duplicate Troy's pheromones to get Worf to leave and decides to take them and run through the ship with it himself, which was both hilarious and stupid. <laughs> Picard ends up crawling through some tunnels, but Predator Worf finds him and drips venom on his arm. He eventually manages to stun him 
in data says he can release the retrovirus through the air ducts, which works. Via Captain's Log, Picard tells us that the treatment Beverly used to cure Barkley is what initiated the Intron virus. And she can't even admit it. She says, in a way, it was my fault. No, not in a way, Beverly. It was your fault. You suck. She says the cure she used on him didn't stop at activating one gene, but began activating all of them, which in real life would mean it was doing a lot of different things to his DNA and I assume would probably kill him. And somehow it got airborne and just infected everybody else. Beverly decides to name this new disease after Barkley, which, again, saved me from having to come up with a synopsis for this episode. <laughs> He transformed into a spider, and now he has a disease named after him. Genesis. Overall? It was good to get some advancement of the Worf troy romance subplot. It didn't quite happen the way I expected, and it was good to get a little bit of Barkley, although I could have done with a lot more. I thought if they had made it Barkley and Data teaming up instead of Picard and Data, that would have been a great opportunity for some comedic stuff, but they didn't. And on a character front, the episode ended up being pretty flat and straightforward. Even having Picard become afraid didn't really add anything. The main idea of this virus, whatever, that de-evolves people is broken from the concept stage, having no basis in reality, but there is potential in having some kind of secret hidden gene in Intron DNA, especially since they found those DNA messages back in the chase. And since they already explained that all these humanoid races come from the same source, it would be possible for one of them to have discovered it and used that knowledge to affect all the others somehow. They could have at least had it be a virus that was introduced by Romulans or something that would just mutate people into monsters. They wouldn't even have to explain how it works. I appreciated them trying to go for a horror feel at times, but the entire concept behind the episode made no sense. Individual scenes and ideas made no sense and just raised questions, like Picard personally going out after a straight torpedo. And the resolution to the entire episode was so easy and immediate, with Data just fixing everything right away. So much so that even from a plot arc standpoint, it was extremely unsatisfying. I gave it a D. There really wasn't anything good about this episode other than Spider Barkley. And for giving him that whole makeup and everything, I would have thought they would have used it more. I gave it a D-. minus. Playing out like a horror movie was an interesting choice, but it's more like a bad horror movie. I liked that Riker tried to contact Starfleet at first, but why didn't at any point Picard and Data try and do the same thing? even before they got on board. I would think that Picard seeing his ship adrift with weird distorted life signs would immediately cause him to radio that shit in. And once they started finding people's skin and people ripped apart, they never said, hmm, we should let someone know about this. This is another episode of waving a magic wand to solve everything and not even showing us, just telling us. What is the cleanup procedure in this case? There are over a thousand people on the ship, children included. People murdered each other. People raped each other, and people ate each other. You know all of those things are true. <laughs> but no one will ever talk about this ever again. I would have immediately put in a transfer and cowered in my room in the fetal position until we got to the next starbase. And what about that dude that got ripped apart on the bridge? We've seen Picard has to contact families when there's a death on board. Can you imagine that call? Um, yeah, so our tactical officer de-evolved into a protoform of his evolutionary chain because our doctor is actually some kind of weird mad scientist, and your son was literally ripped apart. I could see his guts everywhere. It was so gross. I understand the idea of this episode, but the explanation of this idea was not good. It didn't make any sense, and their handling of the idea was not very good, and their solution to the idea was not very good. I'm all for a horror-type episode. We both really enjoy conspiracy, but this one tried way too hard to legitimize an unlegitimizable story, and it did not work. Especially when your attempts at legitimization involve making up a bunch of random shit and just waving things through. Nothing made any sense. Kudos on the creativity, but really on nothing else. And again, Worf and Troy have another weird story about their relationship. Their relationship is just built on these weird-ass things that sometimes don't even happen in real life, just in their minds. But at least now, they have a bunch of little jabs for each other. Worf can say, You're going to be late for your shift. Better hop to it. <laughs> and then she'll fire back. Why don't you go f***ing murder somebody else? <laughs> So 
will join us as we continue to follow the series as it de-evolves. Good thing us not get more dumb as videos keep making. <laughs> Thanks watching. <laughs>